Kiwara at Kabali, which was founded, we think, back in 87, and right before my project, and then so, uh, uh, Richard Rangham founded that, and, and now Karina is one of the people who's carrying it forward post Richard's retirement and runs the database and uh, still uh, does a lot of research at, at Kanyawara and also uh, at Bodango, another of the longest running field uh, sites for chimps. So she knows more than practically anybody about, about uh, long term studies of chimps, especially social behavior. And we're thrilled to have her here. And she's also the nicest of the oh. chimp researchers that they have this reputation for being a little competitive. And there's a shining star of chimp well, researcher cooperation. <laughs> so you. I'm very happy to have her here. Thank and, um, you. I think there are a lot of nice chimp people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's such a great pleasure to be here and, and talk and see old some of my oldest friends, in fact, from grad school and uh, a little beyond. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about our recent work on chimpanzee social aging and some of the things that we are learning about chimp aging. Um, and of course, this is anthropology. So I do kind of, you know, I think thinking about chimp aging does have lots of repercussions for how we think about human aging. And of course, human aging as I get older is something that I think a lot about. It's, you know, there's a joke with the NIH that if you just put the word Alzheimer's in a grant, you're probably going to get it funded. So there is a lot of focus as we get older on thinking about aging. But a lot of the research about human aging has really focused on pathologies of aging and diseases of aging. And that's understandable. And it's a, you know, obviously a huge market in healthcare. Um, but I kind of want to think a little bit more about what can we understand, not about the pathology of aging, but what are the healthy processes of aging? What are natural processes that humans go through as we age? And thinking about wild chimpanzees as maybe a potential model for those processes. And I hope by the end of the talk to convince you that wild chimps can be an excellent model for thinking about human aging. And in particular, what I'm interested in, which is human social aging. Um, and not necessarily just thinking about their diseases, but what are the natural processes of aging in the absence of things like cohort effects that are really hard to get around with humans. And I'll talk a little bit more about the benefits of chimps in a little bit. I would say if we're thinking about understanding human aging, data from chimpanzees and bonobos, I don't study bonobos, so I'm going to sell chimpanzees as a model, is integral to understanding humans. So obviously all of the primates have these kind of long life histories, um, including you know, long periods of juvenility and infancy. What we get with chimpanzees is a creature that in the wild will live into their 50s and even potentially past 60 and experience a long period of old age. So chimpanzees reach kind of their prime of their life at around 35. And then in many, for many individuals, they spend two decades in what we call this past prime life. And that's a lot of time that they have to negotiate this kind of deteriorating uh, physical condition and changing social behavior. So I think in many ways, chimp, that kind of period of almost two decades gives us a lot of kind of ways of thinking about humans who also have decades long experience in this old period. And of course, with chimps and humans, we have a lot of these shared connections, shared traits, not only the long lives, large brains, but chimps are extremely social. And I'll explain their social system in a little bit. But one of the things about chimps compared to some of the other primates is that they have an incredible amount of choice in who they spend time with compared to some of the other primates. Um, and, but what we get with chimps that we don't necessarily have, that is very hard to deal with with humans, are things like cohort effects. So what I mean by that is, for example, if we want to compare today young humans and old humans, it's impossible to get past the fact that every young human has grown up with the internet and with a certain type of technology that, like, as my mother is a good example of, that 80-year-olds don't necessarily have as much kind of interaction with that kind of technology. And I think we would all agree that social, social media and the internet has probably changed the way that we interact with our friends and have social bonds. And that's just very hard to get around. Now, obviously, we can study populations where those cohort effects are minimal. Um, 
but we definitely don't necessarily, we don't have to deal with them in the same way with chimpanzees. So the data that I'm going to show you today uh, that I work with is from the Kibali Chimpanzee Project. It's a long-term term study of the Kanyuara chimpanzees that live in Kibali National Park, Uganda. The site was started by my PhD advisor, Richard Rangham. He started it, as Susan said, in 1987. And except for six months during COVID in 2020, we've had continuous data collection ever since, um, which includes every single day of the year, someone goes out and does 12-hour uh, days of the chimpanzees. So it's an incredible data set. Um, today, the data is Richard decided he was done writing grants in about 2010, which I don't blame him because actually writing grants for some of these long-term field sites is an, an incredible, um, incredible energetic cost. Um, and so I was lucky enough, along with Melissa Eric Thompson and Martin Muller, to inherit this incredible site from Richard. But he's still our like grand pooba. He's still like we still like wheel him out. He's not that old actually. <laughs> Anyway, we still like wheel them out when we need like some big wig to help us with government officials and various other things. But and he's still very much involved in, in research. Um, but the day-to-day -day operations are done by the three of us. And I'm at Tufts. Melissa and Martin are at the University of New Mexico, which is actually where our biological kind of um, our biobank is, uh, urine and fecal samples, and we have a hormone lab over there in New Mexico. One of the things that I will say for any grad students or you know early career people in the room is I think with these long-term field sites these days, it's almost impossible to not have them run as a team. I think it takes an incredible team effort to do the work that we do. Martin and Melissa and I all have different skills, and I think you need that kind of suite of skills and time and abilities to run these kinds of field sites. So just to get you in the mood, um, our chimps have been habituated to human observation since about 1992. That includes all males, all females, um, traveling alone on the ground. Um, but they're actually so well habituated that every so often we can like rope ourselves into harnesses and climb up into the trees with them. And this is a ficus, a fig tree in our forest. It's, we're about probably 40 meters off the ground here. And just to get you in the mood of what it's like to be in a tree with a chimp. surrounded by these animals were totally immersed in, in their lives. Now, chimps spend 50% of the time in trees, 50% of the time on the ground, so we do actually get really good detailed interactions and um, data from them, whether they're in a tree or on the ground. This is our alpha male, and he, I hope the video doesn't lag, but you're going to see him walk past a subordinate male. Um, this is Kakama, and he's kind of puffed up and you know intimidating. And as he walks past, the subordinate male gives this very emphatic pant bark, which is a, sig a vocal signal of, please don't beat me up. I know I'm subordinate to you. And uh, the comma just doesn't seem to even So that would be data that we could collect to figure out the dominance hierarchy. And you can see that even though there's a lot of like undergrowth, we can still get, we have still very good visibility of these chimps. So to get us all on the same page about chimp socioecology, chimps have a rather particular social system called fission fusion that's relatively unique for primates, spider monkeys, and uh, some of the uh, South American primates also exhibit fission fusion. I'll explain that in another slide. Chimps are frugivores. They spend 50% of their time, of their diet, is ripe fruit. Even when it's a poor food season, they will go out of their way to consume ripe fruit. So ripe fruit is something that they will eat every single day. They're male phylopatric, which also makes them somewhat you know, different compared to most primates where females stay in the group. 
that they're born into, like baboons and all the macaques and capuchins. Um, so chimps are male phylopatric, so males stay in the group that they're born into, so they're in groups with their brothers and fathers and uncles and nephews, etc. And then females around the time of ovulation, for this 10-day period around ovulation, have this sexual swelling. That is a really big visual, visual pink signal of ovulation, and usually there's a lot of male-male competition for females who have these sexual swellings. So fission fusion is a particular type of social organization in chimps. Chimps have multiple males and multiple adult females in a group. At any given time, one of those females or two of those females might be swollen. Chimp groups range in size. Actually, probably the smallest wild group that I know of was down to 15 after a disease epidemic. The largest group up to 250 before they actually split. But the average group size is about 50. But we never see all 50 chimps all at once. So they are scattered through their territory, and they form these temporary subgroups called parties. Um, and throughout the day, they fission and fuse. And so they're kind of constantly, they're constantly making decisions about who they want to spend time with. And I think that's what makes some of the social behavior that we see in chimps really interesting, because just say Fred and Harry have a fight, they can, Fred can say, I don't want to see you right now, and actually go off and join another subgroup. And he might not actually see Harry for months. You know, they might, we might not actually see them together for many, many days, many weeks, and sometimes even months. So that's what I mean when I say they have a lot of choice in their kind of grouping. Um, one thing to note here is that males tend to be in larger parties than females, and that females tend to spend much more time alone with just their dependent offspring. So that's kind of a characteristic of at least most of the East African chimpanzee groups, some of the West African chimp groups have more social females. So the data at Kanyawara, at Kibali Chimpanzee Project, we have lots and lots and lots of data that comes in on a daily basis. Um, it's my really fun job to organize and kind of deal with all of it. Since 2009, we have this series of data that kind of constitutes full day focal follows. Our field assistants go out in teams of two, and one person follows an individual. We try to get a full day follow of every single individual from adults to infants in, in the community every month, so we try, to, we try to do that. We get to where the chimp slept the night before, and as soon as they wake up and leave their night nest, a stopwatch beeps every single minute for the day for a 12-hour day on average. So every single minute we watch what that chimp is doing, who they're doing it with, and we have this incredible detailed record of a single chimp and what their life is like. Many days we actually get two, day fo two, two days of fo two chimps in a focal follow. Um, we also, the second field assistant is recording every single thing that's happening around that focal individual in the group. So all grooming, all aggression, all copulations. And it's just this detailed handwritten narrative of what the chimps are doing. And then we have really extensive health and physiology data that goes back to 1996. And I'll uh, explain a little bit about that later. My job is that I take all of this data, I supervise all its, how to digitize it, how to kind of put it all into spreadsheets, how to extract data from it. And then all of that comes to me at Tufts, and I manage a long-term relational database. And just to put it into perspective, I mean, I'm not a geneticist, so I don't deal with like big data in a genetics point of view, but most of our data tables, like our behavioral data tables that go back into the late 80s, have about five to six million rows of data in it. So these are like pretty extensive amounts of data. It's not just like an Excel spreadsheet that you wrangle with. It actually takes a lot of database skill to manage to extract things from it. And sometimes you just want to chuck your computer out a window because it's taking too long or you've done something wrong. I don't necessarily expect you to, to read all of the detail, but this is kind of examples of our full day focal follows. So since 2009, we have about 10,000 full day focals. Um, and that includes equal numbers across males and females. And so the average length of a follow is about 11 hours, um, depending on the season. And we record, every, like I said, we record, I could kind of tell you what a chimp is doing every single minute of that day if you wanted. I, for some reason, can also tell you every time they pee or poop. And um, I don't really know why I can tell you that. But one of the things that we grapple with when we have a long-term field site where we're collecting behavioral data 
and this is more to, for grad students thinking about this, is that when we design long-term field data, we're trying to design data collection for questions we don't have yet, right? For questions that we might have in 10 years. And so it's not that we go in with a question in mind and we think, okay, I'm gonna design a, a data sheet for that question. We have to actually think, what is the kind of most breadth and depth that we can get out of our staff and field assistants and data? And maybe one day in 10 years, someone will email me and be like, do you have a record of every time a chimp pees? Like, I do, in fact, have that. Please use it. I don't know why anyone would want that yet, but I'm really hoping someone does. So we have great data from focals. For the baby focals or infant and juveniles, we focus a lot on play behavior and things that babies do. So the infant and adult focals are slightly different. And this is an example blown up of the handwritten narrative notes, so you can see them. Um, so, you know, we get 758, Johnny, all of our chimps have two-letter codes. Johnny charged, chased, and attacked two on Yogi Bear with kicks and slaps, and Yogi fled screaming. Not surprising, none of the chimps seem to like Yogi very much. He's like one of those chimps that doesn't have many friends. Um, we have some health data. Here's a copulation between Lonjo, the male, and Rwanda, the female. With eight sec that lasts eight seconds, one second longer than average, where the female approaches. And then we have things like intergroup interactions, where the chimps hear some distant calls and respond aggressively with vocalizations. And in total, since 1987, we have 120,000 hours of behavioral data on 165 individuals. And um, sometimes I'm in a department with only cultural anthropologists, so when I give talks for them, I think this is the best best ethnography you could ever imagine, right? Like this is the most detailed kind of peek into the lives of these individuals that, I mean, in, in some way, it's better data that you could ever have, more detailed information than you could ever have with humans, right? Like, think of it this way. I know the average population length of every single male chimpanzee in the group. <laughs> I'm guessing, Brian, you don't know that. No. <laughs> and most, most of you don't start asking. But it's the kind of detail that we wouldn't necessarily get from, from humans. And so there is probably some detail that we can get from chimpanzees that we're not able to get from humans when we think about some of our behavioral questions. Um, as I said, I'm, not gonna, I'm only going to briefly touch on some of this data later in the talk, but we do collect urine samples from the chimps non-invasively, a very sophisticated, high-tech piece of equipment, which is a plastic bag tied to a stick. And when the chimps are peeing in a tree, we can hold our plastic bag under their stream of urine. And generally, in our biobank right now, we have about 80,000 urine samples going back to 1996. Um, and Melissa and Martin have really kind of done the bulk of the work looking at many different kinds of hormones, all the reproductive hormones. We actually, in the field, we can take human pregnancy tests. We smuggle a lot into Uganda. We buy them at the dollar store. And you, because chimps and humans are so closely related, we can use human pregnancy tests on chimp female urine to figure out if our females are pregnant. We have some different measures of energy. Um, cortisol is kind of a measure of both energetic and psychological stress. We can do C-peptide and thyroid hormone, which are measures of energy balance. Uh, we can measure creatinine, which is a measure of muscle mass. Um, we have done oxidative stress assays, especially as it relates to aging. We can look at salt in urine, but our chimps don't have any salt in their urine, so we stopped asking about it because it just doesn't happen. And Melissa and her team are currently working on C-reactive protein, which is an immune marker for some of our aging work. And hopefully you're mostly done eating, but um, we also collect a lot of poop samples. <laughs> we have between something like 15 to 20,000 poop samples. Some of them are with me at Tufts. Um, and on this kind of data, we've done studies on diet composition, digestibility. We've actually shown that as chimps get older, they actually they're, they don't digest their food as well, so the particles in their poop are quite, are quite a bit bigger. Um, and then we've done work on parasites and viruses, which I'm not going to talk at all about today, um, but feel, I'm happy to field questions about any of that work. And of course, from our poop is where we get our DNA information, where we can understand paternity, because we wouldn't necessarily know who the dads are without uh, our DNA work. We've done studies on things like resistance, uh, genes for malarial, re malarial resistance, and we're working on uh, putting together a methylation clock to, from the DNA data. 
And then finally, we have this extensive photographic data collection. Um, my husband builds lasers, so it's actually really helpful. So he helped me build a laser at our kitchen table. And we use that to measure body size in wild chimps, so we can actually track growth and um, the length of chimps. And then, I'm not going to talk about this uh, much at all, but we also have a lot of photographs with baby chimps with their mouths open, so we can track dental development. And we published a couple of papers showing like, the dental emergence times of multiple of all of the teeth for these baby chimps. And uh, that, actually, if you want to ask me about it later, it's a fun story about how science happens. And I'm not sure I ever would have thought I would do that project, but here we go. We have like 10,000 photos of baby chimps with their mouths open. So I'm going to use all of that data not to, to actually show you how we can understand questions about human social aging. But before we actually compare our data with human data, we have to understand what happens with humans as we age. What is the social aging phenotype? And what's kind of interesting is that I think a lot of this kind of focus on social relationships and social aging has come from a more recent understanding over the last 10 to 15 years of the value and importance of social bonds as we get older. So this is a, one of my favorite papers. It's now from 2010 looking at kind of different risk factors for mortality in uh, 148 studies covering about 300,000 people. The way to read this graph is kind of the length of the bar is how protective an effect a particular behavior has on your mortality. So if you give up smoking versus continue smoking, giving up smoking has this really large protective effect on your mortality. What they also and I think they didn't quite expect this, they put social measures in this paper. What they found is that things like high versus low social support and being integrated into your social group had an incredibly protective effect on human mortality across huge numbers of people. And so what they found is that people with stronger relationships had a 50% increased likelihood of survival than those with weaker social bonds. And this is kind of, that really spurred a lot of primatologists to think about, you know, what is the effect in non-human primates. And across numbers of species, we found that social bonds have an impact on survival and on reproductive success. And a lot of that great work has been done in the baboon populations where they have generations and huge sample sizes to look at some of these phenomena. So I think you should definitely, the take home message from this is that it's definitely okay to smoke and drink, but you have to do it with friends. Right? Like that's clearly the take home message here. But what is really striking is how much of a protective effect those social bonds had on your mortality. So social bonds matter. That's one take home message. But how do actually social bonds change as humans age, right? Is it that just people who were good at making friends when they were young are the ones that live longer? Actually, it's not quite that. We actually show, the human data shows that there are these shifts in social bonds as people age. So, older individuals, actually, when you think about how they interpret behaviors that they're seeing around them, actually have a positivity bias. And this is something that I find surprising, because I think the stereotype is often of, like, very grumpy old people. And my mother does not have a positivity bias. So, like, I'm really, like, driven by, really? But in general, when you look at things like workplace studies and studies from organizational behavior, what you find is that humans, as they get older, start to interpret social interactions with a much more positive lens than you do when you're younger. So that's what we mean by this positivity bias. Humans, as they get older, also are more drawn to happy things as opposed to negative interactions. Um, and so that, that's just something to keep in mind. The other thing that we know is that younger individuals tend to have bigger social networks, but when you look at their social networks, some of the, some of the connections that younger humans have are not necessarily the most positive, right? You have a lot of friends in your social network that you're like, you know, they're, they're not the best person in my life right now. As you get older, as humans get older, social networks start to shrink. And those, but people describe their social bonds in much more positive terms. They seem to be kind of these relationships are very emotionally fulfilling. 
And in the psychology literature, one of the actual most, one of the dominant explanations for this shift, both towards a positivity bias and towards these smaller social networks and more emotionally fulfilling relationships, is called socio-emotional selectivity theory. And this has kind of been, for many years, the dominant paradigm explaining that shift. The idea with socio-emotional selectivity is that when you are young, you prioritize your knowledge needs. And you are learning about how the world works. And so you may tolerate negative interactions and you may expose yourself to negative interactions in order to learn about how the world works. As you get older, you prioritize your emotional needs. You have the knowledge you need, and so you can start paring away the negative stimuli in your life and focus on the things that are much more emotionally fulfilling. So younger and adults focus on building new relationships and information seeking, and older adults focus on emotional regulation. So socio-emotional selectivity, this paradigm in psychology, is actually this hypothesis that this shift is contingent upon understanding this human sense of time, this understanding of time horizons, and a knowledge of our mortality. And so what I mean by that is that as, as humans, we understand that things might end. And of course, the ultimate time horizon is our mortality. And so as we get older and we face this ultimate time horizon and we are aware that time is escaping us, we start to think, maybe not consciously, but I don't have time for any of this negative stuff in my life anymore. I've got to get rid of all of these bad people. And the reason that we focus on time horizons is that mortality is not the only time horizon. And if you think about we're in a college setting right now, and um, if you are an undergrad, think about how you make friends your freshman year versus what you might choose to do your last day of college, right? As a freshman, your first day of school, you're like, I need to make new friends. But on your last day of college, you just want to spend time with the individuals that you are already friends with. You're not motivated to go make new friends. So that's what we mean by shifting, understanding that something might end, or time horizon is key. And mortality is the ultimate time horizon. This is my dad who passed away, but he, and he was not a grumpy old man. He just moved from India to Canada in 1965 and was just cold. Like, he was just cold ever, ever since that moment. Um, so he's not grumpy. <laughs> just, but the point here, what, when we were kind of thinking about how to frame and think about aging, we kind of became interested in this dominant paradigm that is really contingent on understanding time horizons and mortality. And there's no good captive data from chimps in these cognitive studies that really shows that they have a long-term understanding of time horizon. And we can, we can debate this later, but I also don't think there's any good convincing data that chimps have an understanding of their mortality. And I'm happy to kind of go into why I feel that way, but it's a hard thing to actually know or, right, how do we test it? Um, and I, my, my feeling about this is that every time another chimp dies and they're exposed to it, they have such varied social responses and different behavioral responses that it's not clear they've understood what has happened to me. So what we were thinking about with this study is, well, what do chimps do? This is the pattern in humans. It's contingent upon what I would argue is a, a human unique characteristic of understanding time horizons. So if chimps and humans do the same thing, it makes us, it kind of forces us to reassess this key kind of underlying principle that this is because we understand time. If chimps and humans are actually different, it provides comparative support for this socio-emotional selectivity theory. So one of the challenges, what, so we actually did this study, I just want to highlight that this is work very much done in collaboration with Dr. Alex Rosati, who is a psychologist at the University of Michigan. I was also her TA as an undergrad, so this is a relationship that goes a, a way back, and she is going to be mad at me for telling you all of that. But um, and also, this is uh, we had this published in Science in 2020. If you have seen this cover, just a caveat: Science picks the cover image; they don't let you pick it, and that's not an old chimp; it's just a gray chimp. But anyway. <laughs> Um, and just the other thing that I think is really cool, I use this data a lot in teaching and for undergraduate projects, and this project actually started as an undergraduate senior thesis, so it was really fun to see it get into, you know, kind of become something pretty special for our lab. 
So for this project, we used uh, 21 years of data from our long-term records from 1995 to 2016. Um, 21 male chimps. We focus on male chimps here because they, because they're the phylopatric sex, they have the stronger social bonds. So there are, you know, metrics that we wanted to calculate, like grooming rates, and to include metrics like that, we just actually don't have. Females are just very not social. So, for example, um, I did a study where we were looking at 2,048 grooming bouts among individual chimps and only 32 of them were among females. So it's really, we just don't get a lot of female-female interactions. So that's why we focused on males. Um, and I also just want to point out, this is a longitudinal study. So we're tracking individuals as they age. It's not a cross-sectional study where we're comparing young individuals to our old individuals. So we're trying to control for some individual variation. So the first question is, what are the general patterns of aging? Or in other words, how do chimpanzees show this positivity bias? And one of the challenges with this study and with any study where we're thinking about how do we compare humans and chimps is, how do we think about comparable data? What does it mean? Like with human studies, we can, we can ask people how they feel about something. So what does it mean for a chimp to show a positivity bias? And the way we looked at this is we kind of looked at their behaviors and we said, you know, there are behaviors that chimpanzees do that are affiliative, like grooming, and behaviors that they do that are aggressive, but that are negative and agonistic, like aggression. What we found in our data set, so this is age on the x-axis and then the rate on the y-axis, is that in general the blue line, which is grooming, slightly increased with age, but it was relatively consistent with age. They seem to kind of just like to groom across their lifespan. The big difference that we saw was in aggression that directed aggression, which is when there's a target of the aggression, versus even non-directed aggression, which is like a dominance display, both of those types of aggression reduced with age, and reduced pretty dramatically. And in fact, what I think is interesting, and I'll touch on a little bit later, is the fact that their display aggression really kind of had the steepest decline compared to what you might call directed or even more strategic aggression. Right? So dominance displays are given to kind of rile everyone up and be intimidating. They say, seem to use that a lot less. They use all aggression a lot but at a lower rate, but that seems to drop off much more. So grooming is consistent, aggression decreases with age. We are calling that a positivity bias because the relative kind of degree of their aggressive versus affiliative behaviors is shifting towards being more affiliative. Right? So it's a tricky, right, these are tricky metrics to compare to humans, but for us that is how we would assess generally chimps are becoming more affiliative and less aggressive with age, or the kind of relative proportion of those behaviors is changing. So do social relationships also shift with age? And I'm going to show you a couple of metrics just showing kind of general sociality scores. In general, older males are more solitary. I, the interesting thing here is that no, one, no male chimp is ever really that solitary. So what we're seeing is kind of a change from kind of 1% of their time being solitary to like 3 to 4% of their time being solitary. So these aren't giant shifts towards being more solitary. They are significant. What I think might be happening here is that Oftentimes, maybe these older males may have a little bit more trouble keeping up with the group, and so they're going to be seen a little bit more solitary because they haven't caught up yet, or they're just kind of a little bit slower, and we're seeing them a little bit less often in a group. But what we wanted to do is, we, we thought, well, okay, but they're mostly in groups. I mean, most of their time is still spent in groups. What is it like when they are in groups? And so what I'm showing you here is data in different age categories. For this study, we actually looked at continuous age. I just find it easier to present this in kind of age categories, where you have the older adults in yellow. And male chimps, a lot of their behavior is going to be patterned by rank. So I've also shown this by rank categories. So you can see how males in different rank categories behave differently. Um, and just so you know, we also modeled rank mm -hmm. continuously as well as categories. And on the y-axis, what I'm showing you is when a male chimp is in a party, 
what is the average male party size? How many males does he like to spend time with? And older males, in general, in yellow, were almost always in larger parties. So even though they have a slight reduction in their sociality, they're a little bit more often alone. When they are in a social group, they're in big social groups. They like to have a lot of other males around them. Then we also looked at um, not just how much time they spend in parties with other males, but when they're in those parties, who do they like to sit next to? So we have measures of spatial proximity where we have kind of the number of times a focal chimp is within five meters of another male chimp compared to how much time they spend in a party together. So like given that they're already in a party together, how much do they like to sit near each other? And again, what we find is that these older male chimps tend to like to sit near other males. So even though they're maybe a little bit more solitary, when they are social, they seem to be more social. They like to be around other males. They like to be in closer proximity to other males. And this is kind of one of my favorite results. One of the things that we can do with our spatial data is look for kind of positive outliers. So we can say, is there another, for an individual male chimp, is there, is there one or two or potentially maybe three or four other males who you tend to sit next to at kind of a degree that is one quarter standard deviation than your mean? And we can look at this in both kind of a, what we call a lopsided way and a mutual way. So a mutual bond, a mutual, what we're calling friend here, is someone who I'm always sitting in five meters to them and they're always sitting in five meters to me and we're both kind of outliers for our social metrics. A lopsided friend is, I always want to sit, like I'm always like your five meter friend, but you have other closer five meter friends. So I like to kind of, the analogy here is like the younger sibling and the older sibling. Like the younger sibling always wants to be around their older sibling, but the older sibling has other better friends. And what we found when we looked at this for um, our males as they get older, is that, this is the lopsided friend, is that the number of friends doesn't change that much. Everyone has about two friends. What changes is the quality of friendships. That these older males have more mutual friends. They kind of drop off those friends that they were always trying to sit next to and no one, you know, they weren't, it wasn't being reciprocated. So what we're seeing here is that there is this shift towards these maybe more, at least reciprocated kinds of relationships. So the number, there's no difference in the overall number of friends, but the ratio of friends. What I think is kind of interesting is as we tease this apart and we look at, okay, so older males tend to have more mutual friends and have these interesting changes in social dynamics. Who are their partners in this? And what we tend to see is that generally when we look at mutual friends, even the prime-aged adults and the older adults tend to have mutual tend to be mutual friends with other older individuals more often. The young adults certainly not, but what's happening in the young adults is that young adults tend to be these lopsided friends of the prime age males and the older males. So what we're seeing, the way that we have interpreted this is that everyone seems to be attracted to these older males. And it's kind of interesting. There seems to be some kind of social cachet that these older males have that other individuals are like, I want to sit next to you. I want to be near you. There's something about you that I find intriguing. And we'll, I'll tease that apart in a little bit. And so the other thing that we wanted to ask is, do males kind of change their overall investment in friendships and in social bonds? And the way that we looked at this was through our grooming data. So we calculated um, the amount of grooming given that two individuals are in close proximity with one another. And we have looked at different friend categories here, so mutual friends, lopsided friends, and non-friends. And what we find across the board is that everyone grooms with their mutual friend more. So the amount of grooming you give to your mutual friend is, is higher than anybody else. And just to keep in mind that older adults have more mutual friends. So as they are getting older, they're investing in these mutual bonds by grooming at a higher rate. That could be one reason why we don't, we kind of see this slight increase in grooming over time, or we don't see this big deficit in grooming as they age. 
we looked at this not just for grooming rates, but grooming equitability both within a bout and over, across the, over the year. And grooming uh, bouts with mutual friends are more equitable across the board as well. So when you happen upon a male, an old male chimp, he's often sitting in a party with another old male chimp. They're often sitting next to each other, and they're often just doing this. And this is Stout. He, in this video, is 56. And Big Brown, who he's grooming, is about 52. And I'll say, last summer, Big Brown died, and I was in the field when he died. And he didn't die of old age. He was 58. He did not die of old age. This chimp got bored by a bush pig and died this epic death. And it's like, we actually calculated he was the subject in over 25 scientific studies over the course of his life. So that's my tribute to Big Brown. It was actually very sad for us to see him. But what a way to go for like this old guy. So here's what I think is kind of interesting. So these old male chimps, they're prioritizing their mutual friends. Everyone seems to want to be close to them. They have, you know, and individuals are interested in them. But it's not because they're the highest ranking chimp. And actually, what we find in our data is that male dominance at Kanyawara peaks between 25 and 30. And then you can see a pretty steady decline. So as they get into these old ages after 35, they're actually at pretty low rank for their lifetime. Right? They're kind of reaching that lower, kind of, they're back at where they were when they just started in the dominance hierarchy. So these are, they're not attractive because they're high ranking. This is the point. We also know they're losing muscle mass. So this is our creatinine data. And again, what you can see is um, for these males, around kind of 30, you start to now see this decline in muscle mass over the last two decades of their life. So they're not high ranking, they're not necessarily the strongest chimps in the community. Now not surprisingly, testosterone decreases in old age. So it peaks somewhere about 20, 20 to 25 at Kanyuara, and then you start to see this long decline. This goes hand in hand probably with the declines in muscle mass and the declines um, potentially in aggression that we're seeing as well. But what's interesting is that when we do, when we've been able to get paternity data from about 40 that here, 39 infants, about a quarter of our infants are sired by old males. So even though they're declining in rank and losing muscle mass and you know generally slowing down probably, they're still remaining reproductively competitive. And it's not just that this is age and this is copulation rate with two different kinds of females. Paris females, who are actually the most attractive females in the group, they're the ones that have had babies are already and are older, versus nulliparous females who are younger and haven't had babies yet. But actually, the, the, the rate of copulation stays pretty consistent even with the attractive females. And their rates of copulation stay pretty high, even though they're losing muscle mass and rank and low testosterone and all of these things. So there's this really interesting kind of puzzle about these older males. So to put it all together and to kind of wrap up, we are finding, at least for our metric, our metrics, that there is a positivity bias in these chimps. The relationships are shifting with age. There's lots of changes in sociality across the lifespan for these um, male chimps. Um, and they are grooming their male, they have more male, mutual friends and they groom them more and more equitably. So in terms of the kind of support for socio-emotional selectivity theory, I think we're finding some pretty good evidence of it. And it's interesting that the, sh the social behavior is shifting with these other kinds of traits that are shifting, like rank and testosterone and muscle mass. So our conclusion is that we are seeing the same kind of shift that we see in humans, that there are similar patterns in chimps and humans and this is happening in the absence of an understanding of time horizons. Now, in our paper, we kind of speculate about what else could be driving this pattern. It's not that I actually think that humans aren't affected by our understanding of time and mortality, just that there have to be alternative mechanisms that probably result in the same phenotype, the same kind of social phenotypes. And I would argue that one of the other things that humans and chimps share as we get older is that we get much better at emotional regulation. 
as we get older. And some of the patterns that we see in, in chimps may be explained by increased emotional regulation, not, not necessarily that chimps ne necessarily have an understanding of mortality. I kind of find the comparison between chimp, chimps and humans a little bit hollow because we can't really understand the evolutionary pattern of these behaviors if we don't have outgroups and we don't think more broadly across other primates. And so we also kind of reviewed the literature on social aging across primates and there are a couple of surprising things that I found out. One is that almost nobody publishes data on old primates, and so there was really a lack of information on what happens in old age. Most people just kind of lump adults together, even though adulthood could range across two or to three decades. Most of the data we had that has been published is on macaques or baboons, and most of the macaques studies are captive. So there is really a lack of information on wild primates across the board, and almost nothing about primates living in Central and South America. But we are gonna, we're gonna talk about that. <laughs> so, dominance patterns with age are pretty highly variable across primates. I don't think that's the most interesting comparison. What you tend to see in the published data from macaques and some primates is actually an increased negativity bias. Where their data has been published, what you tend to see is that grooming rates decrease and aggression rates actually increase as non-ape primates get older. And this is actually true. The one, one study of capuchins that has been published is tufted capuchins in captivity has shown the same pattern. So this is kind of what you might expect to see in um, monkeys, whereas this is what we were seeing in our chimpanzees. So a different pattern between apes and, and uh, monkeys. And there's also evidence in macaques of showing a negativity bias. So people have actually shown pictures of positive faces and negative faces to macaques in captivity. And as macaques get older, they focus more on the negative, the aggressive face as opposed to the positive face, whereas chips have an opposite uh, response. I think there's any kind of limited evidence of any sort of socio-emotional selectivity in the monkeys. And I think what we still don't understand is kind of are apes different we don't know what gorillas do. Gorillas would be a kind of a key comparison to figure out if this is an ape monkey distinction or there's something interesting about chimps and humans. Um, you know, I think gorillas, even though they're larger body than chimps, actually have shorter lifespan. So I think it would be interesting to know what gorillas do. And one of my, just thinking about kind of just speculating what I think might be happening is that for chimps, if you start to decline at about 30 or 35, you have to navigate two and to two and a half decades as an old individual. So you do, you know, this is not like, oh, I'm gonna be old for five years. This is, I'm gonna be old for almost half of my life and I don't wanna stop having babies. I need to figure out ways of maintaining my reproductive success through this post-prime long life lifespan. So I think that we, we, but I can't answer any of those questions without much more comparative data across primates. So where are we going next? You know, obviously what I haven't touched on is what do these friendships do for these old males? What is the function? And I'm not gonna spill all of the beans because we have a paper in submission right now. The little highlight is what, what I think is happening is that these older males are maintaining their reproductive success by forming coalitions. And it's that coalitionary bond with the mutual friends that allows them to get mating opportunities even though their rank is decreasing and their body size is going down and their testosterone is going down. So there's a shift towards thinking, I can't, I still want to have sex and babies. I can't, I have to do it with a friend. I'm going to have to rely on a social partner. So I think that's really the function. Stay tuned for that paper. I think obviously a, law, a question that I hope everyone has is what are females doing? Um, and I'll touch on that. And then I'll touch on this last part about how do, how do friendships affect kind of stress and health outcomes, which is really the question that I think people are interested in from a human comparison. So we have actually done uh, some studies on comparing female and male social aging. This is actually a network study where we looked at grooming networks of male and female chimps. And what we tend to see is actually females become less embedded in grooming networks as they age. Females just really kind of drop, like as they get older, 
they just become less and less and less social. And part of it may be that as they get older and have more babies, they have adolescents and juveniles and infants that they're hanging out with. They tend to invest quite heavily in that kind of family, offspring bond, um, but not with other adults. So that, that's a very different kind of factor. And I should actually say, even though when you look at human literature about social aging and sex differences or gender differences in humans, people often report that there are none, that these kind of patterns are consistent across men and women. But actually, when you dive really deep into the literature about this, it's not necessarily true. Um, so men, as they get older, become more dependent on their spouse and their spouse's friends, whereas women maintain kind of relationships outside of their pair bond a little bit more than, than men. Um, this may explain why when men's wives die, they actually don't they like have no social life because they've depended on their wives kind of social life to support them. Um, but what I think is also interesting is that one of the biggest social bonds for women as they age is that when their kids have kids, they report a big increase in their kind of network with their own kid with their adult kids. And I know this from experience because as soon as I had a kid I was like, "Mom, I don't know what I'm doing." Um, and it, there may be kind of some evidence that supports like a grandmother type of hypothesis in some of this kind of shifting social bonds with age literature. And I think because a lot of that work is done in psychology, this evolutionary framework is not necessarily examined the way that we would do it as biological anthropologists. Now, in terms of stress, we have done a little bit of work on how uh, how kind of stress mechanisms uh, change with age. One of the things that Melissa and I have shown is that as older males, as males and females age, they certainly have elevated cortisol levels. So this is cortisol by time of day, and the old individuals are in the hash lines. And kind of across the day, you see older individuals have elevated cortisol. I don't actually think this means anything other than as they get older, you're, you just kind of see an increase in cortisol dysregulation. What that means, just in kind of simple terms, is that once you've turned on that stress response, it just, as you get older, it takes a little bit longer to turn it off, so you generally have kind of elevated levels. Um, but in general, when we look at chimps in particular different kinds of stressful situations, so, for example, um, when there are pairs swollen females around compared to when they aren't, everyone seems to have an increase in cortisol in response to pairs swollen females, but the old males aren't, like this line is not steeper, so the old males are not showing like a much bigger increase in their cortisol um, in response to that kind of social stimulus or reproductive stimulus. And same with kind of things like what we find is that um, when, when females are cycling, uh, and are cycling and especially swollen, they're getting a lot of aggression directed towards them, but it's not like these old females are showing more of a stress response. So there's a little bit of elevated cortisol, but not necessarily a tremendous amount. Um, what we're doing next for our next project, again, I'm gonna be presenting about it at the AABA, so come on, and I'll be back, actually, in a few months, um, is how does, how do social bonds affect kind of the stress response? And are we seeing kind of social bonds help mediate the stress response, which might be the reason why they might have long-term health outcomes? So stay tuned for some of that work with me and Melissa and Emma Thompson. So what can we, I know I've gone a bit over, but what can we learn from some of this? I mean, other than I just think it's really cool to finally do a study where we can kind of take something from humans and look at it with chimps. I think one of the things when we think about how, what does this say about healthy aging? When you look at kind of programs for older humans in our society, for example, there was a real push a few years ago to get seniors out and have them make new friends and let's bust them to the mall and like get them social. And what was interesting is a lot of the response to those programs was seniors being like, um, I don't want to do that. I don't want to make new friends. I kind of have the friends that I have. And so I think, you know, again, we sometimes think of that reduction in social network or the reduction in friends in as for seniors as a pathology. We think, oh, that must be bad. They must want more friends. They must want all of these strong, you know, they must want to be social. And the vast majority of them are like, no, 
I just want to have time. I just want to have more time with the friends that I have. And so I think we have to think of maybe that decrease in social networks, the decrease in sociality, as a natural form of aging. That is what we as apes are maybe supposed to be doing as we age. So I think that's really interesting. I also, because I run a long-term field site, and it is really hard to fund these long-term field sites for decades, I do want to say, like, this kind of work, or any of the work that we might do on development, cannot be done with one year of data. This required decades of data. And there are still questions that we want to ask that we won't be able to ask for another 20 years. And so as you're thinking about kind of studying primates, the value of these long-term research sites is not the new question, like the question that we can ask, you know, the new thing we can do, the new data we can collect. The value is 20, well, we have 37 years of data that's been collected the same way you know, in incredible detail. And that is this resource that I think is valuable. I just want to shout at NSF and be like, just give us money to keep doing what we're doing. Like, we don't want to collect new data. We want to keep going with this data. Okay, that's my, like, soapbox pitch for Watch Your Bleeding. Um, and then I think just as a fun aspect of this project, it came about, you know, Alex Rosati is trained as a psychologist, and I'm a biological anthropologist. And this kind of project just came out because we had coffee together. And she was like, do you know about socio-emotional selectivity theory? And I had no idea what she was talking about. Um, but I think this was one of the only studies I have done where we've really seen this intersection between psychology and kind of biological anthropology. And it was a real challenge to try to think of how do we actually use our data <coughs> to compare to human data. And I don't know that we got it exactly right, but I think it was an interesting challenge to think about how can we actually use our long-term data to answer or to compare to human studies in a, in a different way? Um, and I'm not, I, I won't, I just wanted to highlight that along with the long-term data, because we study an endangered species, I think, I didn't realize this as a graduate student, but it's become kind of more and more part of my life as I've gotten older, is that I study an endangered species, selfishly I need to work on conservation to keep them alive and in where they live. And I do not think there, there's any good conservation project that's done without kind of input and buy-in and support of local populations. And so on top of the work that I do with the Kibali Chimp Project, I also help direct an NGO around the national park, around Kibali National Park, started by Richard Rangham's amazing wife, Elizabeth Ross, and uh, it's called the Kasisi Project here in the US, the uh, Kibali Forest Schools Project in Uganda, which, um, and we work with 16 elementary schools and almost 10,000 kids a year and we support the schools and their lives, and we try to kind of uh, create a generation of conservationists in Uganda, um, but also we just do things to keep them in school and keep, give them opportunities to succeed so they don't grow up and cut down the forest um, because they have to. And I just want to highlight that this is really a partnership between us and our Ugandan team over there. They actually do all the decision making about what the programs are and what they want and what they need and we just write the grants. So um, it's a very, you know, it's not something, I didn't think that I would be making reusable menstrual pads for Ugandan girls when I was in grad school, but that's a huge aspect of some of my day-to-day -day job is thinking, how am I gonna fund menstrual pads? Hmm. Let's think about that. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is none of this work is possible without our Ugandan staff. I mean, that is, they're the ones that get up every day and collect this data. We've had many field assistants over the course of our 37 years. Um, most, not recently, but uh, Dr. Emily Otali is in charge of our field staff there. She's the first Ugandan woman to get a PhD studying wild chimpanzees, and she's incredible. And we are very lucky to have her, and she keeps my life much easier. So big thank you to her, um, my co-directors, and this is not uh, cheap work to do, so we're very grateful for everyone who's funded us. Thank you.